right, Travis. Well, thank you for joining us here today. Zach, thank you for having me. My pleasure. So, Travis, for the listeners, you are located in Delta. Is that right? Delta, British Columbia. That's right. And how's the weather out there today? Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. We're supposed to get a little bit of snow starting tomorrow for the rest of the week, get a bit of snow. So I noticed right outside the studio here, the uh, grounds people are coming through and taking care of all the leaves in anticipation of that. So hopefully we don't hear leaf blowers in the background. I think we're pretty isolated here. But uh, if we do and you hear something a little bit in the background, that's what it is. Okay. Okay. It's, um, well, it says feels like minus 20 here in Calgary and not fun. It feels like it, or it, it feels isn't. like it. Okay, yeah, I was uh, out hunting about uh, three weeks ago. Balmy, hot weather. All of a sudden, just turned cold on us, and I think it was about minus twenty-five at nighttime. And uh, that was a little chilly at night. Brought the dog with me, and uh, was a little concerned about the uh, one-year-old dog being out in the cold. So we ended up cutting that one a little bit short, but uh, I, I know when it gets in the negative temperatures, it can get a little, uh, little bit nippy. Oh yeah. What kind of dog do you have? Munsterlander. I think mm. that's how you pronounce it. A Munsterlander, Munsterlander. Never even heard of him before, but uh, did a little bit of Google research and I actually did a podcast with uh, Ron Bain. He's got a, uh, uh, a podcast called, uh, what is it called? The Hunting Dog Podcast. And uh, talked about all the ins and outs and figured, okay, let's try this out. Get myself a dog. Family loves him. And uh, he's a pretty good pup. So are they kind of like a bloodhound where they're they're great for hunting? They got that snout that they can pick up on senses and smells? He lives the whole world through his nose. Uh, but they, they call him a versatile kind of hunting dog, which means uh, he kind of does a lot of things. And, uh, you know just instinctively never had a dog, but like this before where right out of the gate, it's doing things. I didn't even have to train it to do. It'll point at stuff. It'll retrieve stuff. It'll, uh, it's just got this natural drive to want to be outside and yet it can still turn that energy off in the home. So happy with it so far. Great. And does he sleep with you guys? In a house or in a bed? What do in you the mean? bed. Hell no, no, <laughs> we're not, we're not that kind of a family. Okay. Uh, you know, I was raised with having dogs outside and that's where the dog lives. Uh, I've acquiesced and the dog is in the house, but he's crate trained. And so uh, just a, uh, a different approach. Love my dog. Great dog. Whole family loves the dog, but we do have some rules in place. He's not on the furniture. He's not on, not in the bed with us. We've got that uh, delineation. Boundaries. <laughs> boundaries. Everyone loves boundaries as much as they say they don't. Dogs love them. People love them. People like to know where they stand, right? And I find it doesn't matter where we are, two-legged or four-legged, uh, knowing kind of where we stand, and it's going to be human instinct or animal instinct to try and push those boundaries every once in a while. But coming back and knowing that we have these kind of brackets or bumpers around us uh, allows us to feel cared for. Totally. Have you always been someone that was an outdoorsman? In one form or another, I would say so, yes. Uh, I've always loved the outdoors. I grew up in a uh, family. We had a commercial fly fishing lodge, and I'm going to put the air brackets here, commercial fly fishing lodge. Uh, it was never operated commercially, but uh, there were four owners, and one of them was a uh, a lawyer. He's the one who ended up finding the, uh, the lodge, and it was run commercially before, and he just kept everything up to date as it ran forward and uh, uses lawyer lawyer skills to ensure all the certs and everything were uh, kept active so we always had that option but uh, never ran a commercial we let scout groups use it but it was a hike-in lodge or a fly-in lodge uh, we take a helicopter in at least once a year to get all the old stuff out and all of the new equipment in and there was speculation whether you could land a float plane on the lake well, I should back up. The pilot said you could land a float plane, but there's speculation whether you could take it off again afterwards because it's about 5,000 elevation. So uh, most of the year we're just hiking in and out of there. Do you still go out there? Every once in a while, yeah. In fact, family's not a part of it, but still friends with uh, some of the other owners and uh, you know, holds a special place in my heart. There was a fire there uh, last year that uh, 
changed how everything looks. Luckily, the lodge is up. I mean, you're the only people on there. Only cabins on the lake belong to the uh, lodge. And there's about, I was up seven other lakes, about 10 minute walking distance from each other. Nobody on them, nobody for miles around. And that was a part that always appealed to me. I just loved being out there and the feeling of knowing that, you know, no one's coming, right? There's, there's a feeling of independence and maybe isolation as well, but freedom, freedom to be able to do whatever it is that you wish to do. And um, I've always loved that. You know, it's either you love the city and or you love the nature and the outdoors. It's, but you have a balance of both, I find. You know, you, you you love tech, you like aesthetics, media marketing, entrepreneurship. Yet there's this other side of you, which is so cool, <laughs> this outdoorsman. Well, you know, tech, love my tech, love my stuff. What do I need? Nothing. What do I kind of want? Well, I love playing with all these different things, right? I've got a podcast, a Silvercore podcast, and started that a few years ago and uh, just to be able to share my passion for the outdoors. But really it, it started around uh, finding other people who enjoyed the similar sort of pursuits that I do and to be able to help them share their passion. And I figured, you know, I would share my passion, I guess, through them. Uh, but I'd spend my time trying to highlight my guests, make sure that they're getting value and that the listeners are getting value. So every podcast I put together would be geared towards either education or entertainment. But if I'm asking for their time, I want to ensure that they're leaving feeling good and in a better place than they were before. And so when you talk about tech, it just became a little bit of a wormhole of what do I need next? And you know this, right? You're, I'm, you're trying out some new gear right now. And I need some cameras. I need, uh, it started out just audio and then started to get the video in there. And what do I get? I don't know. What's Joe Rogan use? I hear he's got a popular podcast, right? And so you just start down this wormhole of just exploring and trying. And it's been fun. A lot of fun. Have you always been someone that loved gadgets and just using your hands and working on things? Oh, absolutely. Let's see. Using gadgets, you know, growing up, I always wanted to be like James Bond. I think a lot of kids look at all the toys that James Bond has and they figure it's pretty cool. And when I was in grade four, I learned how to pick locks and, um, and that was a pretty neat newfound skill. And I always liked the idea of the puzzle that the lock would present. And in high school, I learned how to get into the school's uh, record keeping system. Never changed my grades, but other people asked me to change their grades for them. And, and I, obliged and uh, I, but I didn't do it from a a malicious sort of standpoint it was always sort of the puzzle of trying to get through something I'm not allowed in there well now I really want to be in there right so I'm um, working with the hands is something that I've uh, I think most kids to some degree or another they like building Lego or building different things and you know grade four I taught chemistry in the uh, back of the class and that meant making disappearing ink or making things go boom. Super cool. Is, right. <laughs> That's what chemistry is to a kid, right? Um, but yeah, working with my hands is, uh, I get a lot of satisfaction with creating things. And I see the podcast as an extension of creating things, which is going to be visual. It's going to be audio, but it's also going to be the creation of connections, like what we're doing right now. You get to create a... Um, a connection with somebody who in regular life, maybe, maybe our paths wouldn't cross. No, I, and I, truly, I don't think ours would. I mean, a lot of my friends hunt and I find it very interesting that uh, there's a stigma around it. Do we need to hunt? Well, I guess at some point we have to analyze what needs are, right? Like in this day and age, what does somebody really need a podcast for? What do you really need? You've got public transit. What do you need your own vehicle for, right? Do we need to hunt? Well, at one point, if you wanted to be getting any food, you're going to have to make sure you're going out there and you're hunting or you're gathering or you're foraging or you're farming. You're, you're, you're doing something to, uh, to get that food in, or you've got a good connection with somebody who can do that for you and you can provide some other service or value to that individual or people so that you can get that in return. Some people say, yeah, absolutely, we need to hunt. And I think from a soul standpoint, there is a connection with your natural environment 
that you can achieve through hunting or fishing or foraging that's very difficult to achieve through any other means. If we co-op that responsibility onto a third party, if I have a butcher and an abattoir taking care of meat, if I'm going to eat meat, if I've got a farmer doing all of the farming for me and supplying me with my vegetables, I don't have that intimate connection with my food that I otherwise might have if I'm doing it for myself. And for me, that's the driving force. When people look at hunters, they will get an image in their head, especially if they're not a hunter themselves. And that image usually is going to be something to do with camouflage, maybe, or like Elmer Fudd or firearm. And there's certain things that kind of stand out in somebody's head when they hear hunter. Just like if you hear like police officer, you're going to think, okay, badge, a gun, um, red and blue, like certain things kind of stick out. But a police officer is way more than just a badge or a gun, just as a hunter is way more than the camouflage and the firearm. But that's tends to be what grabs people's attention. Uh, for me, the act of hunting is a connection with the environment and a connection with myself. And I just don't find that really any other place unless I get into the outdoors and I really intimately start connecting with my environment. It's, um, it, it's good for the soul. Do you think you learned hunting through somebody or was it just you fell in love with it because it's nurtured throughout your environment throughout your life i i don't know if it's not, the whole nurture and nature sort of <laughs> the nature about nature and yeah, nurture and nature conversation about that i mean i could look at uh my siblings who i grew up with who don't share that same connection in the way that i do so that might um uh, that might contradict the nurture argument. But the hunting portion of it is something I got into actually later in life. The outdoors part is something I've always been around. And the fishing, you know, I've, I'd enjoy fishing. I wasn't a fishing fanatic. And there's so many more people who are way better at fishing than I am and know so much more about it. But for me, it was just the process of being outside. Um, having a little bit of time alone with my thoughts, uh, to work things through, even at a young age, people have things that they work through. That's the part that really drew me to it. The hunting part is I got into later because I never, I never had that access. My father hunted, but he'd never took me. Um, and I think for him, hunting was going out with, he was uh, Vancouver police. So with other members of the forest who were hunters and it was a social event right? Something just, uh, maybe a lot of drinking by some and go out and just kind of, um, an escape. And so he never really got into the hunting aside from that. And, uh, I wanted to learn more about the natural environment. And I saw hunting as a means to be able to do it. Like what's, what's growing out of the ground and why is the grass look like it's been trampled on what animal would do that? Uh, What's been nibbled at? What animal would do that? How do I find that animal? Right? That's. I have a yeah. friend. Um, he owns a restaurant here in Calgary called Rouge, and his name is Chef Paul Rogalski. Rogalski. Yeah, I know him. He's a great guy. He and is a great guy. How do you know Paul? I know him through Rouge. I used to do some marketing. No, he's great. And I think he does something with foraging and. Yeah, he's with Kevin Coswin and with. Um, uh, survivor man, Les Stroud doing, uh, FTW from the wild. Great show. If you, if your listeners are into the wilderness, Kevin is an awesome person. Paul's an awesome person. I mean, they're just really down to earth. And of course, everyone knows Les Stroud from the whole survivor man series. And they go out and they find food that's out in the wild, whether they forage it or they hunt it or they fish it. And poor Paul, he's essentially got a black box competition every single episode where they come in and they bring all of these different ingredients and he's got to make something awesome out of it. And if you know anything about Paul, he's a pretty awesome chef who runs an award-winning restaurant. So uh, he does well with it. They all do well. You know, Rouge actually was world 50 best restaurants one year. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 He's, uh, he's doing something right in life. 
And what that something is, I think, is that he's pa he's passionate about something and he's chasing that dream. And his success is a byproduct of the hard work that goes into that. And it's uh, really, really fun to watch people who love what they do and they go all in and they see success from that. Whatever success means to that person. You know, we talked about it on the phone call, the why. And mm. I think when we find out if someone knows their why, it's super interesting. So Paul knows his why, and we can clearly see it in his work, his craftsmanship. You know your why. The why is always evolving. What is your why? I'm curious about that. I have like 20 tabs open on my phone to understand <laughs> what is my why. And I'm trying to dive deep into it. So Simon Sinek, um, he, he's a, an author, a speaker. He mentioned one way to find out your why is to ask not family or close friends, but just people in general that you know, what is it about me that you enjoy? And you start finding out the similar traits that people like and, and how you make them feel. Mm. And then you take a step back and you can realize here's a little glimpse of maybe what your why is and what you leave as an impact for others. Life is a prism, give or take, or complicated more than that. But how do you find out the other parts? What did, what did you do to find out your why? Because you've nailed it. Well, I don't know if it's been nailed, but the... Uh... The caution, I would say, and Simon, brilliant fellow, awesome public speaker. Um, you, you know, um, Stephen Bartlett had him on twice on Diary of a CEO. And I thought there was great value to what Simon, because he was, you're able to really condense Simon's messaging. And he's really good at keeping on track. And if there's something he doesn't want to talk about, he says, there's no value in that. I don't want to talk about that, right? Um, but if you're asking those around you what it is that they like about you, I would caution a person to be very, um, you know, that, that saying, show me your friends, I'll show you who you are. Maybe the people that you're asking who are parroting something back, aren't the people that you really want to be having, uh, that feedback from, or maybe it's going to give you a, um, sort of a, a jaded perspective. I, I might be more inclined to ask, right. And maybe what they come back with is something that you find in yourself that you don't really like and that's not what you want to be so maybe it helps you identify what you are not and i think if you're looking at what your why is identifying what is not your why might be the easier approach so if somebody comes back and they say zach i really love hanging around with you because every time we get together you pick up the tab and um you got a fancy car and uh, i like coming to your cabin and right these are just people that are hanging around you and using you do you want to continue that sort of a relationship that might be a good eye opener for you right um getting to my why i think it's an ever evolving thing but you have to really break down what it is that is most important to you and uh, earl nightingale he talks about success right and what is the meaning of success and he condenses it down into success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal Okay. That, that sounds good. So that would be the school teacher that loves teaching school that is progressing every day to become better at being a school teacher. And they're making an impact on the lives around them. Okay. That's a CEO who wants to make a bunch of money and that's their worthy ideal. As long as they're progressively working towards that worthy ideal for them, that's success. So for me, I've identified that my family, my wife and my kids are extremely important to me. And I want to ensure that whatever I'm doing is helping them develop into a more positive person in a more positive way and providing them with more opportunity and positivity within their life. Uh, I recognize in myself that I enjoy creating things, whether that be creating a business and I've created a few creating, uh, doing woodworking or metalworking or, uh, electronics or starting you know, a podcast starting the podcast, right? That creation process for me fuels me and I love it. Um, so if I can continually learn to be a better person for myself in a way that allows me to create and allows me to experience the things that I enjoy, like being outdoors and 
uh, connecting with nature. And that process also aligns with the betterment of those around me and those that I hold dear, because that's a very important piece of the puzzle. And I think many people in the personal development process forget the value to other section of it. I got to work on me. I got to be better. I got to make sure I can take care of myself first before I can take care of others or whatever people look at. And sometimes they just have to stop and regroup and say, what value am I bringing to Zach right now? If I'm on his podcast, is it me just blowing off hot air? Am I just talking at him or am I trying to connect and provide information that'll be useful to you and the people that are listening? And I find the second that I look at that, I look at how I can connect with you on a deeper level and how hopefully what I'm saying maybe might impact somebody to do something to make their life better or validate whatever it is that they're doing in their life. That feels good to me. And that personal section of growth uh, goes towards my why. Yeah, you know, I definitely think us talking about the why, uh, the audience can also realize, well, you know, do I know my why? And our whys will change throughout the years. You know, my why four years ago is different than it is today. Talking to people that have gone through darkness to find light and uh, to realize that, you know, I wasn't alone in a lot of things that I thought I was. That failures, um, ups, downs, mental health, mindset, we all go through it. I thought I was quote unquote fucked up. <laughs> You probably are, mm -hmm. but we all are in the same way. That's the thing. Right? I used to put people on pedestals. Lux e tenebris. That's a Latin saying from darkness, light or light from darkness. Uh, being able to find that light and be able to get there can be difficult when all those lights are off, right? But if you can see your next step, or if you've got somebody else who's walked that path before that can help guide you. It's as simple as saying, okay, move your left foot forward a couple inches. Okay, now you, next step's going to be right foot. I mean, that's an analogy, but we learn from watching other people. Um, and, you know, you're saying you, you thought that you're, you're fucked up. Well, while we've been talking here, you had some headphone issues and you changed your, uh, your headphone jack from one to another. Um, I said, no, 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 ain't, ain't broken. Don't, don't try and fix it. Right. Um, you, you've mentioned you've have 20 other things kind of on the go and all these different things. I've got ADHD. I can recognize certain personality traits. Okay. Whatever that means. Right. Like I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was in grade three, I was going to be shipped off to a different school, kicked out of the family. I was too much trouble. Uh, but then they found something cool called Ritalin and they said, Let's give this kid a whole bunch of Ritalin and uh, we'll get him back on track, right? And they put me on an experimental dose of uh, Ritalin for the province. Apparently, they could only prescribe up to a certain amount. So I was taking like eight, 10 pills in the morning, a bunch in the afternoon. And, and oh yeah, it was, um, it sucked. <laughs> it sucked. I mean, your eyes are sensitive to light. I remember coming out of school, I could barely barely open my eyes and people are getting picked up and I'm looking like, where do I have a ride today? Where's my ride? And uh, how, how are all these kids keeping their eyes open and affects headaches and appetite and all the rest. I've got into grade eight and I said, forget this cold Turkey. I'm off. I ain't taking this stuff anymore. And, uh, but anyways, a bit of a sidetrack, maybe that's an ADHD thing, but uh, I can recognize certain traits and others when they have similar type of, of, um, personality traits. So, um, may, maybe when you look at yourself and say, well, I fe felt I was screwed up. Okay. Um, probably to one degree or another, depending on how you look at it, or maybe you're absolutely normal, like everybody else. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. You know, we, we see one side, there's so many perspectives to a person, you know, people are com complicated. We are simple, but we're complicated. And I realized everyone's got a story. So when I got sober, I didn't go to the bars anymore. So my social life got out the drain and because uh, I was surrounded by that. 
Mm. So I'm alone. What do you do? Start a podcast. So you've been sober for how long? Uh, so November 25th, a couple of days ago, was two years now. Okay. So not yeah. a drink in two years? Not one drink in two years. Good for you. Thanks, man. Good for you. More and more studies are coming out that just, there, there really is no positives to alcohol consumption from a cognitive standpoint, from a physiological standpoint. And I get it. There's that whole social aspect that you end up paying for it afterwards. Uh, I found that uh, moderation is a massive point in whatever it might be, whatever that, uh, that thing that's got you, whether that's social media, because people are addicted to their phones. They're always on there flipping through that dopamine hit or alcohol or drugs or food or whatever it might be on your path to being happy, which is an interesting kind of, excuse me, an interesting path to, to look at because it's counterintuitive trying to be happy it will backfire. It doesn't work. Um, regulating your sleep, moderating substances, getting exercise and having some sort of whatever that worthy ideal is for you that you can work towards gives you a pretty clear path towards being happy. If you, and I don't know if you've been finding this, like you've moderated your substances. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your sleep is like. Hopefully it's good. It is um, good. Sleep is better. Um, peace. Seriously. You're feeling peaceful. I feel at peace. And, um, you know, whether the external world is rocky, which oftentimes it is, or maybe it's always been like that. And I was running away from it, but mm. I can face a lot of things now and, uh, it doesn't rattle me. Interesting. And you're, well, I used to get nervous somewhere. and I used to, you know, good days, bad days. I was always running. Running for exercise or running away from things? Running away from things. Okay. Yeah. And so you've moderated substances and you get, probably get some exercise. You look like a fit individual and, uh, what you're working towards right now with your podcast, is this bringing you, is it bringing you joy? Yes. Awesome. And you're, all you're trying to do is connect with others and share that connection and share that happiness with your listeners. Well, happiness, but I think also, you know, what we just chatted on the why, if you question me on it, how many others must be wondering or haven't even had that brought up to them? What is your why? Are you glad that I brought it up? Very much so. Thank you. Okay. So, and that why will evolve and it'll change. And at one point in your life, it'll start to become a bit of a North star until it no longer holds that shine for you. Um, if you find a shiny enough why, and a lot of people do, it'll hold their attention and it'll hold them for the rest of their life. Life goes through changes. Sometimes people's whys are, I want to graduate high school. I want to get my driver's license. I want to, what, whatever that is. And, or I want to, and those are short term and those are kind of like wants. I think when you really start breaking yourself down to what it is that is you, and yeah, maybe talking to friends and others is, is a good way. I, I really think that, um, uh, eliminating what is not you is, is sort of the, an easier approach because you can really make some broad strides towards getting closer to where you're at by saying, I am not a, whatever, a vengeful person. I am not a person who's just in it for me. And then, it, then you can start really working towards kind of where, what your why is. So we hear that a lot. Okay. You know, you should be selfless. You should be out there for others. But then we hear the other side, which is put the oxygen mask on first. Right. Get right before you help others. Again, moderation, balance. There, where there's got to be a, it. there has to be a balance in there. Yeah. If you're in such a place that you're going to die because you don't have your oxygen mask on, and by putting that oxygen mask on, you're going to be of more service to others. Okay, that's the way to go. But I think people tend to often overlook the service part because they so deeply want to be better themselves or what they perceive to be better, that they continually chase this idea of happiness or idea of perfection, which is so skewed 
through social media, through, through our own minds, we'll look out and we'll see somebody doing whatever and think they've got it all figured out. You mentioned it earlier, right? Nobody could be feeling what I'm feeling. I've had, as you have had many conversations about PTSD on the podcast. And one thing that I'm coming to learn, so I've read through the DSM four and the DSM five, and I'm looking at how they kind of define it and looking at different case studies. And the overarching thing that keeps coming back to me is these people who feel like there's something wrong with them because they have this diagnosable disease, whether that's ADHD or PTSD or whatever it might be, they don't realize how absolutely normal they really are and how their physiological response to external, external stimulus is very similar across the board. And it's a natural occurrence. I mean, it's something natural that your body does to help you cope with it. And if you try and fight that and repress it and you feel ashamed by it, you're kind of just doubling down on the, on the actual issue. So like PTSD, for example, if I'm, if I have a label that I can now put on it, a lot of people are like, okay, this is me because of my PTSD. It'll be the same as me saying, oh, that's me. I do this because of my ADHD, right? And I'll joke at times about it, but I never truly feel, I don't even, I'm not even convinced despite being diagnosed multiple times. I'm not even convinced I actually have ADHD um, because I don't want to wear that label because the second that you're wearing it, it's it and it's something you can't take off it's a part of you and it and it's a barrier barrier to your own growth similar to the why i when i did think about that i thought okay if i figure out my why am i putting myself in a box because you know as entrepreneurs what do you do i do a lot of things just like yourself travis <laughs> but the overall goal is the same impact whether that's personally or within your community and community can be anything, you know, this podcast we're building is a community. That's it. But the why in a box scares the shit out of me. Is being in a box bad? Doesn't have to be. I think I mean, I'm in a it... box in certain things, not drinking. Okay. I'm in a box sure. now. That's a good thing, isn't it? It's a great thing. I guess. Right. So maybe making sure that the box we're in is one that we feel comfortable in. And if I feel comfortable in it and I'm growing, able to have some growth and that last piece of the puzzle, which I think is essentially important, being able to impact others around you in a positive way, even if it's just a little bit, if my personal growth is negatively impacting those around me, I'm doing something wrong. If my personal growth is doing nothing for the betterment of anybody else around me, I'm not going to have that same level of fulfillment as well. So what would cause you to stop podcasting? No, no, Travis. Going to keep rolling with it. I love it. Okay. Good. It's helping me heal. It sounds weird, but it's like therapy. What if you're hundred percent healed? Would you stop? No, I would slow down on maybe how often, which okay. in December, I'm actually going to kind of reorganize, restructure, and come up with a better plan. Mm. Plan for the podcast. Plan for the podcast. And just in life, you know, you got to revisit things. What mm -hmm. can I do better in life? You know, mm -hmm. I do it on a daily, but now you got to plan. Not because it's 2023, new year, new me. It's just going forward in life. <laughs> you know that saying? Yeah, I hear you. And, and the reason I ask that is because, I mean, life will throw you curveballs. Yeah. Things will change, right? Oh, yeah. Um, like for me, when I quit the podcast, I love doing the podcast. I love connecting with people like yourself, Zach. Um, but if I'm no longer getting that connection or bringing value to others, whether that be to my guest or through to the audience, I would find a different way to transition so I can continue to do that. If and everyone's why is going to be different, right? If the podcast brings in money and the Silver Horror podcast doesn't, and I don't know, I don't have any intentions of ever monetizing the podcast. If like for me, the podcast is something 
and it sounds like very similar to you, where you can connect with others. You say you find a healing aspect. I mean, I, I, I'd be lying if I said that I don't learn more about myself and feel a better human connection after every episode I do. And I leave feeling uh, energized and I'm not, I, you know, they say introverts, they get in the crowd and it drains the energy from them and extroverts will get in the crowd and they get energy from it. I, under that definition, I would say that I'm an introvert, yet I still get energy from these sort of things. So that's kind of neat for me. So uh, all my life thought I was an extrovert. When I stopped drinking, I realized I truly am an introvert. There's a, um, so Brad Brooks, he owns a company called our galley and he does he work with like meat eater and, and other groups of individuals who film and they're out there in the public eye and they're doing their thing outdoors. And he says, Trav, something I've learned, basically all of us in the field are introverts. Everyone who's out there with these podcasts, with these videos, with these are introverts. Isn't that weird? If that's, if that holds to be true, because I would say from the definition of being in a crowded place, like I, I got to go to Vegas. Anymore. I used oh, to, I, hate it. I, I used hate to enjoy it. it. I thought, Oh, I, I, I couldn't sit with myself, Travis. That's what it was. Ah, so being around others, see, that's where the being in the wilderness and the outdoors for me helps me become centered and it helps regroup and everything that's in my head that seems important or your brain starts just running a train on you and you're getting all worked up about whatever it might be. You get outside and your priority structure changes and you're alone with your thoughts. That for me is, um, an important part of the process, uh, to continue on its mm -hmm. own accord. But it's interesting that, you know, I think about it as you get older in life and you know, sometimes it's not age, it's lessons, understanding what is life? What is life? Like I said before, um, when I was drinking versus now different. Um, and you start putting that timeline in yourself and saying, what's important to me? To fill in that time and let's hope that it goes beyond that age for you but let's say it doesn't if we were to start doing a countdown on that what are the most important things to you and i think as you really start to drill down on it you're going to find that the only thing of real value is time and that death is a thing that gives that time value if we didn't have that end point for us then we wouldn't have that value, right? It would just be limitless. We'd be like, like the Greek gods who play petty pranks on people to keep themselves entertained, right? Um, but n having an intimate relationship with death, I think is a very important piece of the puzzle that a lot of people tend to miss in life in our death is a very closed door event. And it kind of brings you full circle to hunting because there is a life and death aspect to hunting. You're not co-opting the responsibility of the harvesting of that animal to a third party. And you respect the life of that animal. And when you sit down to eat it with your family, you can talk about that event and what uh, the great hunt and the shared experiences and, and all the rest. But yeah, I, I, I think that uh, uh, that would be a very pivotal moment for you, having that oh. uh, that that happen. And, and you know, yeah, it's trauma, right? And do you try to chase happiness often rather than sorrow, no, you, pain, sadness? No, neither. I don't chase sorrow, don't chase happiness. I've learned a long time ago that that's, that's, that is to chase happiness is a self-fulfilling prophecy of sadness. It is counterintuitive. It is so funny that you have this idea of what will make you happy and you chase that and you're always going to be behind it. If you chase something that fulfills your why, brings you up, you're learning on an ongoing basis and brings up those around you, it brings value to others, happiness will be a byproduct of that effort and hard work. Well, I think uh, we can leave it at that, brother. All right. Thank, thank you, you for very today. much. Yeah. Thank you for having me on your podcast. I had a fun chat.